Scott LaRock, a.k.a. The True Boogie Down Productions, a.k.a. The glue that put that crew together, the, a.k.a. The, the guy that put the battery in Karis' back to be the MC that he is currently now, the teacher, whatever you want to call him. Scott LaRock was that dude. Scott LaRock, the way Scott and I first met, he was helping open up a record for me. And I'm trying to remember exactly where I met. I think it was, I had to be, you know, show my age now. There was this thing called, Columbia used to have every Tuesday morning, they used to have a listening party for other records that would come up and come releases. Scott, being who he was, to, to give you a little bit of history, Boogie Down Production did not start it out the way people know it now. Boogie Down Production started as a DJ crew between him and this guy named Robert Francesis, and he was out of Brooklyn. At the time, Scott was living of all places in Brooklyn. I met Scott at that. Again, he didn't know who I was, but we connected there. So he said, yo, come, you live in the Bronx, come, I'm starting this record pool. I said, yeah, I'm already part of SOS. He said, no, but come to this thing. It's called Kev Co Record Pool, and just, you know, hang out. So here I come, Scott Rock. Another thing that people may not know, Scott Rock was responsible for having one of the first recordings of Treat Like a Prostitute and Lottie Dottie recorded live at Broadway 96, which is the club that he used to work at. So the tape that everybody was rocking those days, that was Scott Rock. But fast forward to Scott Rock, first time we really connected, he comes to me, he goes, I heard you, you, you know, you told me before that you, you know, you produce stuff too, that you've been working with the SP-12. So he had a drumulator. He didn't know how to program it. So he comes to me, brings the drumulator to Kev Code. I help him program it. All of a sudden, he goes, yo, I got this this kid. I'm, I'm coming out with an album soon. I was, I was like, you know, you know, we back in the days, we heard that a lot. So I was like, that's dope, you know, whatever. Yeah, here comes Boogie Down Productions out of Bad Boy. I was like, yo, this is crazy. I said, who do you got? He says, you know, the, the business card I gave you? I was like, yeah, I looked at it. He goes, you know, he said, the business card had a B-Boy similar to this B-Boy here, believe it or not, on the card. And I'm like, that's dope. He goes, the guy that drew that is the guy that it's gonna be my MC. And it's that KRS one on the thing. So KRS first affiliation with Boogie Down Productions that I can see is that. And I'm, I'm I've been waiting for the time to because I KRS and I have never met in this new light. I met him back in the days of Christmas when we were doing no record promotion of that, but his first involvement with Boogie Down Production was a designer for the business card. He designed the logo for the the, the character on the business card. He goes, This guy right here is a dope MC. The album comes out a week before Scott got killed, he calls me, I'm at SOS Record Pool, he calls me, he goes, yo Lou, we just got, we, we're about to get signed to Jive. I still want some production from you. A week later, he passes on. I mean, I said, I knew, I never knew my Scott LaRock, really, in the sense, I knew my Scott Sterling. I tell people all the time, and you know, the depths of my involvement in the industry, people have no idea. And if you don't, you know, people can collaborate the story. Ask Chris, ask Chris, how did Scott start? I'm pretty sure I'm one of the few people that can tell you that story, the way Scott came into this game. Last year, I did a thing called Ultimate Breaks 45s with Biz, myself, Peanut Butter Wolf, um, J Rock, Supreme La Rock, and Red Matic. And it was the talk of the town. It was the talk of this country, believe it or not, because they were like, what the heck? And it was on a Sunday night at the Echoplex. We sold the place out, and we had everybody from Fat Lip, a far side do an impromptu, two verses. We had Howard Johnson come on, wanted to perform so fine. We had Dame Funk come perform. We had Percy P perform. We had everybody from Mad Lib. My man, uh, Adrian Young was in the audience also, you know, saying, um, and Chris was coming through, and I was, and I was hoping he did. I don't know why it didn't happen. It didn't come, you know, it didn't happen. But I don't think there's anybody that has the same connection that I've had with Scott. Probably besides Chris and D Nice and those guys like that. But him and I used to hang out royally in that sense. In those few months that we broke bread before everything happened, you know, with the, the signing of, you know, the record coming out on B Boy Records and all the other stuff. He was that kind of dude. You know, a uh, very astute, very smart man for sure. And the game, the way he played the game, he knew how to play the game. He, he, people had no idea how much in depth he knew about the game. Because again, he was a DJ for a minute, and he was running in those circles. You understand? Back in those days, you, you know, you, unless you had major props from the companies to go pick up records when you needed to pick up records, 
you know, you you we, we wasn't able to get the promos we were to get. So he he was everywhere. And another person that doesn't get mentioned enough for for shaping the way this industry is because if, with Chris, we're not intertwined with with Scott. There was you know the lyrical game the way it is now would not been it would not been for sure. So here you got two people that I know were in my life instrumental that I was close to. Well, three people: Chep, Scott, and and Paul. That I don't know. I won't question, but I don't know how I was so blessed to have them all three in my life. That pivotal members of this industry that we know as music to to be in my life in that sense, man. Now, what Ultimate Breaks and Beats did is, you know, Break Beat Lose going through Mad Vinyl, finding the illest breaks and presenting it to this burgeoning culture around the world. You know, I had a lot of plans. I wrote the treatment for the video. I had a whole marketing scheme that got rejected. It was like, like I'm on a label again, and I thought I was going to be doing it officially independently. You know, that rubber band was an exact size of his, so it, it burnt the motor, so, I, so the motor burnt out and the turntables broke. I ain't never say shit. He ain't find that out till like 20 years later. To see him coming, I'm still thinking that's a, some sound guy or whatever, and he's going blah, 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 and I go, huh? And he just stole on me. Pop clocked me like right around here. He like, he's, he got me good. 